So today I want us to look at just a short observation I made this year about potency. Potency or the loss of potency. I usually don't know how to come up with titles for my sermons. That is the one who knows. So I think as we flow, you just know where the emphasis of the Spirit is. Amen. So potency is like the might in your spirit. The might in your spirit that you receive when you encounter the Lord. I want to say hi to so many people like Brian. Hi. Being a mother and a preacher at the same time is a problem. I just want to say hi to... Hi. <laughs> I can see Milton here. Nice to see you, Milton. Okay. Let's be serious now. Potency is the might in your spirit. And the might in your spirit is, is what is demanded for to respond in the time of need or in the time of manifestation. I've seen Lewis. Hi. Hey. Will I preach or will I greet people in this congregation? Potency is the might in your spirit and it is uh, what you need to respond when it is time for your manifestation. Manifestation is not necessarily coming to a pulpit and manifesting. Manifestation is a daily responsibility for every believer that you are faced with different things on a daily basis and you are supposed to respond from a place of the might in your spirit. Not from the space of experience, knowledge that you have or the money that you have or the credentials and the titles that you have. You are supposed to respond from a might in your spirit. Hallelujah. Even if a beggar comes to you, you're not responding because you have the money to give the beggar. You are responding because of the might in your spirit. The might in your spirit is what will give you the precision of answering your enemies. It will give you the precision of responding to any need that presents itself to you. So that is potency. And I have seen in this year 2022, the enemy has been hunting down the might that is in the spirit. He has been ensuring that you accumulate might. You open your spirit to go and receive might in a fellowship like this, in your closet, where there's impartations of grace in your spirit. He ensures you go for all those fellowships, all those conferences, all those to get might so that he can come and swindle you out of it. Hallelujah. So at times he's not resisting your prayer life. He's encouraging you to go and pray. So that at the end of the day when you receive the might. He can still steal it from you. It's as though you went to pray for, for him to profit. Hallelujah. The loss of potency has caused people to be halted, number one. Number two, to be silenced. 
And number three, to be suppressed. That you come out of here as a dynamo. You come out of here as a man of war. But by the time I meet you the next day, you are wasted. There's nothing in you that can respond. So being halted is losing your cutting edge. Losing your cutting edge. And if you have a sword, it is very blunt. It does not have the sharpness it needs to have. You lose. You start working with the bare minimum of your potential. You have so much potential, but you just work with the bare minimum. God has given you the grace to evangelize to 50 people when he imparted on you might. But if that substance has been lost, you can only evangelize to one person. But the target of God when he was giving you the might was that this might, if you use it well, you can do a hundred people. And that time, you, when you know you have the might, you're even writing down in your journal, my resolutions for today is to evangelize to 100 people. You know, you know you have that grace. But when it comes to the time of manifesting, you no longer feel you have the strength to go beyond one person. And one time I had an encounter with the Spirit of the Lord, and the Spirit of the Lord told me, if you do not exercise your full potential, you are just exercising half of it or a quarter of it. The rest will be demonically manipulated. You'll enter demonic manipulation if you don't use full potential. Full grace. Hallelujah. If God has given you a measure of grace, your work is to use the entire of it, not to use a portion of that grace. Because the grace that you have not used will cause you to enter demonic manipulation. And some of us, I usually feel, I feel you have the ability to do more. How I'm seeing you in the spirit, you have the ability to do more. You are just limiting yourself. And when you limit yourself, the rest that you have left becomes a weapon for the enemy. It quits, but it becomes a weapon for the enemy. So when your might, your might is being hunted down, you work on your bare minimum potential and you leave the rest for the enemy to use. When you're halted, you have no access you have no access to, excuse me, to realms of determination. To realms of determination. You know that you are the one your family is waiting for. To change the situation at home. To change the situation um, of finances in your home. You know you are the one. When you look at yourself, you know. You're not being proud. You just know I'm the only one. If, 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 I look, if I miss it, this family has missed it. I can't see anyone here. It's not pride. It's, it's knowing the truth. And when you're in that realm, you're in a realm of determination. It means that you're the one that determines who goes to heaven in that family. You're the one that determines if, whether people are going to remain in poverty in that family or whether people are going to cross over to realms of wealth. You are the determining factor of your family. So when might has been removed in your spirit, you lose that grace of determining the future of your family. 
for me, I know in my family, I determine that people must go to heaven, whether they have lived all their lives in sin, even on their deathbed, even if they have refused Christ. As long as I am serving God in this altar, they'll give their lives to Christ. Because I remember last year, I lost, I lost an uncle, and I've shared this testimony. And this uncle, I've never seen them sober my entire life. They are chronic alcoholics. And my entire life is more than 20 years ago. They started drinking before I was born. To a point where if he does not drink, he has so much tremors. We encourage him to drink so that he can just walk. For him just to walk, we encourage him to just take a sip. On Christmas Day, we are sure we are going to look for him in a ditch and hire wheelbarrows for him to be brought home. Then one day he woke up and said, I have stopped drinking. I laughed. I laughed. You, you have stopped drinking. And he said, I know I've said this many times and I've relapsed, but this time I have stopped drinking. And how I knew that he had truly stopped is that on Christmas, we did not hire people. And he was able to sustain a job. He was not able to drive for a long time. But after he left, he was able to sustain a driving job for three months. And when the contract ended, he started feeling sick. And when he started feeling sick, it got worse and worse and worse. And so... Um, he was in the hospital and my mom sent the video of how he was in, in, a, in a mask, in the oxygen mask. And because there was a growth on his throat, they had removed part of the meat for testing. So the oxygen was hurting him on the throat. For those people who have known about being put on an air mask, they know that the air of the oxygen is quite dry. It usually hits the this part very hard. So imagine it's hitting it and it has a, a wound. So he kept on saying, I want this mask to be removed. I want to go back home. And at that point, I knew my uncle is dying. And I, I told um, God, I have not yet preached the last gospel to him. So if you want him to die, wait for him to sleep this night, tomorrow morning, I will call him, I will minister to him, he'll give his life to Christ, and he'll come and see you in heaven. It was a Saturday. So I went, there's some people were in my house, I, I, I only told, I think I told Chelimo, please pray for my uncle, he's between life and death. My grandma was saying he's between heaven and earth. So at night, I have an encounter with a matriarch and the matriarch, I ask the matriarch, if my uncles die, are they going to heaven or are they going to hell? And the matriarch told me, your uncle is going to give his life to Christ on his deathbed, he's going to make it to heaven. So I'm like, I asked for two uncles, but you're saying one uncle. So I woke up and I started rebuking the spirit of death. Why are you talking about a deathbed? And I've told God to sustain this life. So I rebuke the spirit of death. I go back to sleep. And I see my uncle come to me and tells me, I want to repent. I want to leave alcoholism. I want to leave all my sin. I want you to pray for me. And pray for me until I cross over. So I took him he told me I was in a particular church and somebody frustrated me. And I took him out of that church and I walked with him in the spirit. I walked with him. I walked with him as I'm speaking in tongues. I'm speaking in tongues. I'm speaking in tongues. I, I command his conversion, his translation from darkness to light. Then we got to a place where we slept on a bed. And I was like, this is so weird. If somebody finds me praying with, for my uncle on a bed... So I woke up, and immediately I woke up, I received the news that he had left. 
that moment, he had appeared to me too. He was repenting in the spirit. And I told my, my parents, leave him alone. Where he has gone, he cannot come. He has never seen salvation. He's seeing salvation for the first time. Because somebody in the realm of determination was able to pick his soul in the spirit. And I told God, thank God you sent me that dream. I would have I had a case with you because I told you to keep him until he gives his life to Christ. And that night, he transitioned with my tongues. You understand what I'm saying? So if you have might in your spirit, there are people who cannot be saved unless it is you that saves them. So the devil knows that thing and especially in family setups when you see like you're the only one who is getting the revelation the rest are getting it and losing it are getting it and losing it know that those souls are yours for a spoil and when we went home everybody was at peace and the Lord told me it is well he has he is with me. And one thing he told me was that the Bible says in those days that whoever will believe shall be saved. Not whoever has read the book of Colossians. Where was he going to get the book of Colossians in Achangaden? The whole 46 years he lived in his life. But towards the end of his life, he didn't even know, but he just started repelling alcohol and calling me to pray for him when he's sick. Then I knew. So we are alert. Whether we are asleep or not, we are saving men. Hallelujah. So what is that thing that caused God to cause me to help him his might? might in my spirit and how you know you have might in the spirit most of the time look at your dream life that's why I'm using a dream for this illustration look at your dream life there's a relative of mine who had an encounter with Satan in their dream life and told Satan if you want to kill me kill me eh? so I'm, I'm like is that how you fight the devil? Which, which discipleship class have you gone to that you tell Satan, if you want to kill me, kill me? So I need there's a problem. <laughs> there's a problem with this. Another one told me that they had a dream with a serpent. And the serpent tried to bite them. It was very, but my younger sister was able to kick the serpent. So I'm like, between you and my younger sister, my younger sister is better placed. <laughs> you understand? Study. What are you able to resist in your dream life? What is defeating you in your dream life? If people are chasing you and you are running away, there's something wrong with might. They are strangling you and you wake up, ah! There's something, your inner strength is depleted. Hallelujah. When you're silenced, that was the second thing. When you have weak, a weak might or a weak inner strength is that you are intimidated. You're intimidated. Your boss just said, you you come, mom, they are going to suck me. In fact, in fact, I'm sure tomorrow I'm going to get a warning letter. Mom, I'm very sure I will not finish this. You're easily intimidated. People can easily cause you to fear them because of threats. 
let's just um, use that for silencing and when you're suppressed you have no access to grace so that we can just go to the scriptures uh, for the sake of time I hope you're being blessed so far thank you for that so know that potencies are hunted down in valleys or valley spaces valley spaces let's read Genesis chapter 14 verse 17 to verse 24 Genesis chapter 14 verse 17 to verse 24 it says and the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaumah and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shaveh, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread, even to a shulashe, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say I have made Abram rich, save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which went with me. Anna, Eshkol, and Mamre, let them take their portion. So one of the people or the spiritual entities that hunt down your might is the king of Sodom. He's the king of Sodom. And he was hunting down this potency at a valley called the Valley of Shave. The Valley of Shave, which the Bible calls the king's dale. And the offer to get this potency is in verse 21 which says and the king of Sodom said unto Abram give me the persons and take the goods to thyself give me the persons and take the goods to thyself the persons that is your solical strength that is your might that is granted to you by the spirit and the king of Sodom is saying now that you have gone to war and have taken the persons and you have the goods um, just give me the persons and remain with the goods you ought to know that your potency is usually gained from spiritual warfare that when you continue warfaring in the spirit the spoil one of the spoil that you receive is inner strength. Hallelujah. Sometimes somebody say, Mom, I'm too tired. I fought a lot. I don't think I want to fight anymore. But the more you fight, the stronger you become. The more you fight, the stronger you become. When I hear people talking, I can, I can tell the person who has a warfaring spirit and a person who has not engaged war. I can always tell. It's just a spiritual grace I have. I know this one has not fought any battle. And I know this one was at war last night. I'm able to tell. So if you continue engaging in warfare because Abraham went to save Lot... Lot was taken by the kings that were fighting Sodom. And, and when somebody came to tell Abram about it, he took 318 servants that were born in his house, gave them weapons, went and took Lot and other people and took goods. So those people are what I'm calling inner strength. Those persons that the Bible says is what I'm calling inner strength. So after you have come out of that warfare and you know I've taken spoil, I've restored back favor in my family, in my life. I have restored the job that I lost in the realm of the spirit. When you have restored it in the realm of the spirit, it translates in your inner man as might. 
If something was lost, maybe you lost um, your health, you are sickly, and you went to fight the devil that took your health. If you see it restored in the realm of the spirit, it translates in your inner man as might. If money was stolen in the, in the realms of your life, you just find that you're in scarcity and you go to battle in warfare and you see the money restored in the realm of the spirit, it translates in your inner man as might. You understand? So by the time it's manifesting in the realms of the natural, that your health has been restored, your money has been restored, the money comes as a good and the inner strength comes as a person. So you did not just get the money back. You did not just get the job back. You did not just get the health back. You also got a might. It was a gain you received. Are we together? If you lost... I remember one time I was in campus. I, and when I, when I get money in campus, hey... After I've paid my partner community and everything, I cannot rest. I cannot rest until that money is over. I remember it was, I don't know, 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. I left Parklands to come to town. I don't know what I'm coming to town. I just said, whatever I will see that is good, I will buy. No. So with my haste, I came to town. Then somebody asked, I was like, you, you know the way us ladies, we like those hawkers. I'm just looking, dresses, shoes. I want everything. I don't even care if, if tomorrow I will eat or not. I just want to deplete the money. And somebody asked me, help me with 20 shillings. I want to take a bus. I don't have 20 shillings. And I gave that person 20 shillings. Immediately I turned. I knew I've lost something. It was not just 20 shillings. He took part of my strength. So immediately I realized I went back. I looked for him to give me back my 20 shillings. <laughs> and I didn't find him. And that was how my shopping haste ended. I went back to prayer. God, now what is this spirit that makes me to go to town even when I don't even want to go? Now 20 shillings somebody has taken. And when I saw the restoration of my money, I knew that it is not just money, physical money that has been restored. The sight of the restoration in the spirit meant that there's might also that has been restored. Hallelujah. I remember at times I used to tell that God is just showing me I have money in the realm of the spirit. I'm driving in the realm of the spirit. Ah, how will it help me if it's in the realm of the spirit? How will a car that is in the realm of the spirit take me from here to Embu to go and see Brian and his team? How? But later on I understood that as long as in the spirit I have might. Hallelujah. As long as it's in this, I'm just seeing it in the spirit and I'm sleeping hungry. <laughs> I, what do I have? I have might. So it, it may take time to manifest in the realm of the physical so that when it, it, it comes in the realm of the physical, I know it has just come as a good, but the main thing was the might that was being restored. And the king of Sodom comes to attack that thing that you have received in the realm of the spirit that translates as might. So what is your work? Your work is like Abraham that says that I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take any, any thread, even to a shulashe. I will not take anything that is thine, so that thou shouldest say, I have made Abraham rich. What do you do? You make sure you do not transact with the king of Sodom at any cost. Do not transact with the king of Sodom. Be very careful when you get spoiled in the realm of the spirit. You have a dream that your money has come back. You have a witness in your spirit that something has entered you 
that is of grace, that is of God. Be very careful. Most of the time, the king of Sodom will manifest to transact with you. And when you do that transaction, you have lost the persons. Hallelujah. May the, may the Lord give you discernment to know who to transact with. G Gift was telling me, was it? No, it was Collins. That there was a place they used to eat mandazi in campus. Then the Lord told him not to go and eat mandazi there. And it's after Kesha. Imagine Kesha be to be mandazi. Where do you get the strength? But God opened their eyes and they were able to see that this is not Mandazi. This is the king of Sodom. And doing what God has done in the Kesha. Hallelujah. There's a place we used to take tea here with dad in those days. That tea was, we said we are, we are not eating in town anymore because we knew that these hotels in town have issues. So we said, the only thing we are remaining with is the tea. God just, just, I tell you, one Sunday as I was headed to the bus stop, I saw that hotel burning with fire. It has never recovered. <laughs> we said, God, there's no, we have, we got the point. May God open your eyes to know the king of Sodom. Who is not just giving you offers? There are some people I said, even if they give me offering, I refuse. I say, uh, even, I'd rather walk. My spirit cannot take that offering. Because I'm exchanging that offering for a good. I know a person in my life, if they send me money, something in my life must break. My phone must break. My car must have a problem. I'll use that money to repair And they send good money, so you can imagine the damage. I can put one million, just know. Just know the. <laughs> Hallelujah. What preserved Abraham is that Melchizedek met him before he met the king of Sodom. Melchizedek met him before he met the king of Sodom and gave him bread and wine. And I'm praying that your encounters with the Lord here will not just end at encounters, but you will meet with a king of Salem, a king of righteousness, who will give you bread and wine. When he gives you that bread and wine, you are so satisfied. You can tell the test of good gifts and bad gifts. You can tell the test of a good offer and a bad offer. Some people come and tell me, Mom, I've gotten a job. I say, that is not a job. Leave it alone. That is witchcraft. Mom, but I'm earning 100. That is not a job. Leave that thing. But, Mom, I don't have rent the landlord. I say, that is not a job. That is a serpent. But in my heart, I'm like, hey, God, that was a good deal. Even though I said, no, it was a good deal. The next place where you lose your potency is in the valley of Sorek. Before we go to the valley of Sorek, the king of Salem gives you bread and wine and you tithe to him. <laughs> There's no end that you're receiving bread and wine. You tithe. So when you come to a place where there's revelation that is rich and the wine is the spirit that is, comes as a demonstration of the word of God, God has salvaged you from the king of Sodom. So when you tithe and you connect with the ministry of Melchizedek, you have allowed a resistance, a defense for your inner strength. When the king of Sodom comes, you tell them, I've already lifted my hands to the possessor of heaven and earth. Judges chapter 16. Today I feel I, I have grace. Yesterday I was just quarreling. I, yesterday when I was teaching, I, I was teaching at the same time 
I am fighting these women. And have you ever seen a battle between a woman and a woman? It's very different. It's very chaotic. We pull each other's hair. We pull each other. So that was, I was doing that at the same time I'm preaching. So today at least, I'm, I'm just defending potence. So, verse 4 says, oh, I'm in Joshua. Sorry, just a minute. Verse 4 here says that, and it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek. This is Samson, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him, and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and we will give thee every one of us 1,100 pieces of silver. Delilah it herself, the name means languishing. Can you imagine falling in love with a woman who is languishing? Languishing means to lose strength, to lose vigor to lose your vegetative strength, to pine, to waste away. And that's the spirit you fall in love with in the valley. And that is very true. Sometimes I told my husband, for me, with strange women, how I notice strange women is that, number one, love at first sight. I love them at first sight. Or number two, hate at first sight. I repulse them. Love at first sight, I want to just, I don't know this person, but I just want to go to their house. I want to eat with them. I want to go for a sleepover. I just want. I think this is what happened to Samson. He has come from carrying a gate and bars from his shoulder at midnight and ascending a hill and put it and faced Hebron. When he came down, he met with a woman, fell in love with her. And the woman's name is languishing. The woman's name is a waster. The woman's name is a depleter of inner strength. That was her name. Look at the things that lead you to give up your potency. The things that lead you to give up your potency, number one, are the seven green widths. That is in verse 7. And Samson said unto her, if they bind me with seven green widths that were never dried, then shall I be weak and as another man. A green width is like a rope, but a rope that is from a plantation. These plantations that have stems that are quite strong. And the greener it is, the one that they used to use, they used to use it for elephants, for rhinos. It is strongest when it is green, not when it is dry. So that, if we are to interpret it, is to reawaken the covenants of your past. Reawakening the covenants of your past. Refreshing the covenants of your past are leading you to lose your potency. I saw a verse here in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 18. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 18. It says, Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin as it were with a cut rope. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin as it were with a cut rope. Meaning that iniquity was somewhere. You took a cord of vanity. You went and started pulling iniquity from where it was in your past. And you start pulling it to your present. Green wheat are cords of vanity. Cords of vanity that draw. Iniquity did not have any problem with you. You say the past is the past and it is where it is. Then one day you appreciated vanity in your soul. You took a rope went to your past, brought your past to your present. You are leading yourself to lose potency. Hallelujah. Vanity is a serious sin. It's a serious disadvantage to anyone who wants to keep their inner strength. The moment you start considering the things of this world greater than the things of the spirit, you yourself 
have volunteered to take a rope. Go where vanity was in your past. Go where iniquity was in your past. And bring it back. Start saying, mom, I had overcome this sin. I don't know why I, I, I'm beginning to feel like I'm going back to it. No, you became vain. You took a rope called vanity. And you went to your past. And you drew iniquity to your present. Number two, new ropes will lead you to give up your potency. New ropes. Psalm chapter 118 verse 27 says, God is the Lord which hath shown us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords even unto the horns of the altar. That as long as you are serving in this altar, there's a rope, there's a cord that is binding you to this altar. Hallelujah. There are places you cannot go. There are sins you cannot do just because you are bound. But immediately you start considering new ropes. You have chosen another altar not the altar of God. Disconnecting from the altar that has sustained your salvation is acquiring a new rope. Because if you disconnect with the altar of God, you have connected with the altar of the enemy. New ropes. You are losing potency. Saying so nowadays, I don't feel like tithing. I don't feel like going to the altar. I don't feel like serving. I don't feel like submitting. I just feel like this thing is too much. You are disconnecting from the rope that is keeping you as a living sacrifice before the Lord. And you get new ropes. You start serving the altar, Lucifer. You are playing with your inner strength. Number three. Let's just go back to Judges so that I show you where I'm getting this one. The new ropes were in verse 11. And he said unto her, if they bind me fast with new ropes that never were occupied, then shall I be weak and be as another man. That is when you usually feel, I feel like doing something new. I feel like doing something different. I think this thing has become too mundane. It has become too monotonous. I feel like I need a change in my life. You are, you, you are telling Delilah to tie you with new ropes. The next is a web, verse 13. And Delilah said unto Samson, Hitherto thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Tell me wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web. That is the vanity of deception. The vanity of deception. Job chapter 8 verse 14. Job chapter 8 verse 14. It says, I, let me just read from verse um, verse 10. Shall not they teach thee and tell thee and utter words out of their heart? Can the rush grow up without mire? Can the flag grow without water? Verse 12. Whilst it, whilst it is yet in his greenness and not cut down, it withereth before any other herb. So are the parts of all that forget God, and the hypocrite's hope shall perish, whose hope shall be cut off, and whose trust shall be a spider's web. So if your, your trust is a spider's web, verse 15, you shall lean upon your house, but it shall not stand. You shall hold it fast, but it shall not endure. When you start accepting deception, you are leading yourself to lose your inner strength. Your hope is like the hope of a hypocrite that perishes. You have hope on things that cannot stand. You have hope on things that are passing. 
you are having hope on things that you are only seeing with your two eyes. If you can't see them with your physical eyes, you can't have faith. For you to have faith, I must bring a physical thing for you to have faith. But if I give you a spiritual construct, you don't want to have faith. You are trusting in a spider's web. Can you imagine trusting in a spider's web? Just picture a spider's web. Now, trust in it and use it to climb a building. Trust in it. Try to lay your head upon it. Will it even hold anything? Hallelujah. Lastly, the attack to your potency is vexations and the battle of words. And I said in this ministry, we will not allow people to talk badly about us. We won't say, everybody has their own opinion. No, you can't have a bad opinion about me and you are peddling it everywhere. That's their own cup of tea. God will judge them. I will join God to judge people who are talking. Lies. Because the extent of their, of their lies is your death. If somebody crafts a lie well about you, you will be executed. Psalm chapter 58. Psalm chapter 58. Let me just read the entire psalm. Do ye indeed speak righteousness, O congregation? Do you judge uprightly, O ye sons of men? Yea, in heart ye work wickedness, ye weigh the violence of your hands in the earth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. That's the emphasis. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. They have practiced those lies from their wombs, from the wombs of their mothers. Verse 4. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ear. That if you are in a vexation space where people are speaking accusations against you, lies against you, they are casting aspersions that are as a serpent's poison. Have you ever met somebody who was bitten by a snake and the poison is coming to the heart? Five, which will not hearken to the voice of charmers, charming, charming never so wisely. So the other has become deaf, closed the ear, so that even if the charmers are trying to redirect them, they cannot be redirected. They ensure that the lie they have spoken will reach the people that you need to receive favor from, and they do not want to be stopped. You try and tell this person, kindly go and verify this information before you tell the boss. They say, no, I'm going to tell the boss. It's not my work to verify. The boss is the one who will verify. That's how unstoppable. They are deaf to wisdom. You tell them, please do not go and uh, spoil for this person their opportunity. Even though they did this wrong, we can just handle it from this point. They say, no, I cannot allow for such a person to... They cannot be stopped. Verse 6, break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Break out the great teeth of the young lions. Their teeth are great. They have a dominion of speech against you. There are people who are born to speak against you. The Bible says they have been estranged from their mother's womb to speak lies. Their assignment, their demonic assignment is that they will always lie. Spaces where you need to get favor, you need to penetrate, you need to advance, they are always there to block you with lies. You are in cases after cases after cases after cases just because of the things they have said. Verse 7, let them melt away as waters which run continually when he bendeth his bow to shoot his arrows. Let them be as cut in pieces. So their lies are arrows. They are not just lying against you. They are shooting arrows against you. Have you seen someone who uh, arrows have shot them and they are celebrating? 
and they're saying, it's okay, just, just shoot. I know it's your work to shoot me. I know it's your weakness to shoot me. I think Christians, we are, dis- we are, we are like a spider's web. If, if, if we can believe that we can be shot with words and not look for a way to judge archers. Verse 9, before your pots can fill the thorns, he shall take them away as with a whirlwind, both living and in his wrath. That they use, it's, it's, a, it's a mystery of pots. They are lies, they are accusations are a witchcraft mystery of pots. And pots are where destinies are shut. Somebody keeps on lying to you, know that they're trying to shut your destiny. They're trying to limit you into a pot. Fix your destiny into a pot. But the good news is that the righteous shall rejoice when the, he shall see vengeance. May the Lord cause you to see vengeance against people that peddle lies against you. Lastly, how you now sell your potency is that you shave the seven locks of your head. You shave the seven locks of your head. You give up your pursuit of perfection in the maturity of doctrine. Perfection in the maturity of doctrine. But every person who wants to restrain, I mean, to sustain their inner strength is a person who is always looking, how am I maturing doctrine? How am I maturing understanding? How am I growing to perfect doctrine? Not somebody who is saying, no, that doctrine is not for us, as we are babes. That is somebody who is just shaving their locks. Because the doctrine that devils have even if they tell you, you will not understand. If I bring here a witch to start describing what they are doing. And as we want simple, they chew for us, we just swallow. You are shaving the seven locks of your head. And immediately they shaved the seven locks of his head. That was it. That was it. The Philistines were able to take him out, gorge out his eyes, make him a sport. He ended his life as an entertainer. That's how you, you know you have lost. You started as a minister of God. You ended as a comedian. Even if you're earning money, you lost your potency. You started as a powerful woman of God. You ended up as a model. And we say, at least we thank God that nowadays pastors are embracing fashion and they have become models and we thank God. You lost your potency. You are not creative. You are not bringing color to the body of Christ. You lost your potency. And just to note before we praise about us, this strange woman is that she removes your strength. She does not overcome you in your strength. She removes your strength. She removes that which you need to fight. There are two kinds of fighters. There's somebody who knows you're strong and they'll come and fight you and even if they defeated you, you you are still strong. You still retained your strength. It's just that they had a good day that day. But a Delilah will remove the strength. You won't even fight. And number two, a strange woman like Delilah is that even if you're progressing in victory in the Lord, You are not guaranteed of the next victory. You are not guaranteed. Samson was able to resist the the green widths. He was able to resist the new ropes. He was able to resist the spider's web. But he could not resist the seven locks. What's the difference? But he is progressing well. He won the first battle. He won the second battle. He won the third battle. What are the chances that he will lose the fourth battle? The strange woman is prominent in his heavens. If the strange woman is prominent in your heavens, even if you win a hundred battles, you are not guaranteed of victory in your next battle. You cannot use the history of your victories 
We are supposed to use them. If there's no strange woman, you can determine your next victory. But as long as a strange woman is in your heavens, you cannot determine your next victory, no matter how many victories you've had before your next battle. I remember dad told me the way you prayed for Ruto to become president. I remember I abandoned SVM, I abandoned KF, I abandoned everyone. Just praying for this nation. I'm just waking, I'm just praying, I'm just, I'm not going anywhere. People are calling me, I'm on flight mode. This year is they have been on flight mode the most. You are seeing me online, but you, I can't pick your call. I said, the way you have won this battle, you, God is going to cause you to pray for Trump. I mean, for the Republican Party to get the next victory in the U.S. And I was like, hallelujah. But that is only possible if there's no strange woman in my heavens. If a strange woman is in my heavens, even if I pushed Ruto, I'll be surprised. Let's be on our feet. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 15 becomes my prayer for us today. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 15 says, For thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall you be saved in quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. Quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. I know I am most dangerous when I am quiet. I'm, I'm very dangerous when I'm quiet. I know. That somebody persecutes me and persecutes me and underestimates me they become surprised. I'm not moved. I remember there was a time a gang of girls arose against me when I was in Form 4. I was born again. I was just praying for people. And they hated me just because I'm born again. I, did, I was good to them, but they just hated me. And one of the, they came on top of my desk and they were yelling their frustrations, they don't know what they are saying. It's just the way um, Paul went to preach the gospel in Ephesus. And the craftsmen were saying that Paul has said we do not worship gods that are being worshipped with hands, meaning that the silver that we are crafting for them, they will not buy anymore, and therefore we will be at loss. The Bible says that they brought an apple, they were shouting for two hours straight, and the Bible says others did not even know what they were shouting about. There was confusion. These ones are shout they found the blacksmith shouting. They started shouting. They shouted for two, two hours. Can you imagine going to people to a village where people are just shouting? Asking them, what are you shouting? I don't know. Ask the next person. Maybe they know. So when they did that and they were waiting for me to retaliate I just kept quiet and I said I know when the battle will be drawn I know I know when the battle will be drawn and God did a miracle for me in my case I, I just popped out and every one of them that climbed my desk called me and told me you are of God we are very sorry for all the things So I was like, I didn't pass so that you can tell me sorry. Why are you saying sorry? Which things did you do to affect my grades? But they knew the battle has been drawn. In quietness shall your strength be. Do not be afraid of your enemies. Do not be moved when people talk against you. When they are talking against you and you begin to be moved, you are losing your strength. Go and handle them in the closet. Go on. They have done that to you. Go and pray to your God. Call upon God. Do not be moved in your heart. That thing that you carry that is of God, 
can deliver you from the worst. Even if Al-Shabaab surround you, you will penetrate. You will go. If you have might in your spirit, you will go. You will come out of that thing. Hallelujah. But if you are moved in your heart, your heart is chaotic with stress. You are the first one. You are the first one that will be taken out. I pray that we receive might, power in our inner man. Our strength will not be lost. We will not be wasted by strange women. We will not be wasted by kings of Sodom. Pray for yourself. I'm living the life Jesus promised me. Take back what the devil stole from me and I rejoice today. For I shall recover it all. Yes, I rejoice today. For I shall cover it all.